Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the invitation to this event. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to discuss with you some of the second pillar issues. Uh, well, currently in Poland, we are, we are also thinking about a major reform of our pension system related to third and second pillar. So uh, pension reform discussions uh, are also very interesting from Polish point of view. But uh, before we get to the discussion, please let me just start uh, with providing you with some major pieces of information about the development of the second pillar in Poland over the past two decades. Uh, the story that I would summarize as the rise and gradual decline of the second pillar in Poland, it's definitely not a 100% success story or even f quite far from that, but a very interesting story worth taking a closer look at because there are quite relevant conclusions that can be drawn. So we'll start with some shortly about timeline, with, then we'll focus on two major reforms on 90, of 1999 and 2014, then we'll get to the second uh, PLR pension funds precise, specifically to their investment policies and their role for the stock exchange in the economy. Uh, later, I'll try to summarize some of the obstacles that uh, were encountered in the process and also try to talk about some controversies related to that reform because there were many controversies. And finally, I would like to uh, present you the current proposal uh, of the reform to the pension system. It is not certain if the reform is going to be implemented, if the laws are going to be adopted, but we are very close to that. We've got a very specific draft of the legislation that is currently under discussion by major institutions in Poland and the government is willing to introduce uh, or to adopt uh, uh, that legislation and introduce the system as early as next year. And even if the system is not introduced, it is very interesting to take a look at it because it contains some lessons learned from the second pillar developments up to date in Poland. Uh, shortly about timeline, in 1997, main uh, legislation related to the uh, pension reform in Poland was adopted, but the launch of the system uh, of the second pillar took place in 1999, so there was some time uh, for the preparation of the system, and later for more than a decade, nothing significant, well, nothing critical happened to the system. There were some significant changes, but not crucial ones. And in 2011, there was the first uh, very crucial change in the system, namely contributions to the second pillar were cut significantly by more, by more than two thirds, from that seven, more than 7% mentioned during the first presentation to just 2.3%. Uh, and although I think that the dates here are not that important, please uh, note that 2011 is just three years after the financial crisis, and it's not a coincidence during the financial crisis, Polish public debt increased significantly, and that was one of the reasons behind that cut in the contribution. And the most important change since 1999 took place in 2014, what had already been, been mentioned uh, today the, during the discussion after the first presentation. Uh, a little bit more than half of uh, the second pillar assets uh, was, uh, to put it straightly, uh, nationalized or taken over to the first pillar in the form of treasury bonds mainly and remitted. But I would say that was not the most significant change. The, sig the significant change, uh, or more significant change, was also the one uh, already mentioned today. 85%, according to the data that I have, of the people were transferred with their future contributions, not existing money in the second pillar, but future contributions from the second pillar to the first pillar again. And I will talk in detail about it later. And that started the process of the gradual decline of the second pillar, but it's very gradual, and I will show, show some data show some data related to this uh, later. And finally, in 2016, a proposal for the, uh, another reform was put on the table. Uh, I personally like to call it uh, a quasi third pillar introduction because it's voluntary but in a very specific manner uh, which will be also discussed in detail later. And there are also some uh, adjustments to the retirement age in the process but in the end we are uh, at the point where we started. Uh, so focusing on the 1999 reform, I think it, it must be said that it was not only the introduction of the second pillar, but it was also a critical change to the first pillar uh, pension system. It was a move from defined benefit to the uh, to, to defined contribution system also in first pillar. So a pension uh, from the first pillar is calculated based on the contributions to the system mm, during the working uh, period, on the valorization, so 
a kind of proxy for some investment result and on life expectancy. So nothing is granted in the first pillar any longer. Uh, and uh, then uh, there, that was also a partial move from the pay-as-you-go system to the capital-based one uh, in the form of the second pillar and uh, privately managed uh, open and pension funds investing in the capital markets. Uh, and let you know, so that information was also provided during the first presentation, but let me put it this way, that it was obligatory for the youngest citizens and voluntary for the young ones. Between 30 and 50, mm, they, the, those people had a choice whether to enroll in the second pillar or not. And uh, finally, in the last bullet point, we also have the information provided that 7.3%, but let me put it into perspective. Uh, at a 7.3% out of 19.5% of the salary, so it is close to 40% of the entire pension contribution that went to the second pillar. So it was quite a significant part of the um, financing for the pension system. Uh, and second pillar specifically um, was, well, let me start with saying that um, the general idea for the Polish second pillar was to ring fence the system uh, from other parts of the investment uh, industry in Poland. It was feared in Poland that uh, money governed in the second pillar uh, could have been used uh, to, for example, enhance investment results of mutual funds or to other benefit of the um, shareholders uh, or pe people managing that money. Therefore, the setup was quite uh, unusual and expensive. It was required to set up a separate asset management company that could have and still could, ca can provide only one investment product, pension fund, uh, no other activities are allowed. And uh, single investor, single entity ca can have holdings in only one pension fund asset manager. I will call those asset manager pension, pension fund companies from time to time. So you cannot invest into several pension fund asset managers. You can invest in one only. Uh, a consent from a regulator was required. Some, there were some capital requirements, requirements as well. Uh, and to, well, getting back to our uh, discussion uh, that took place a moment ago, each pension fund company had to enroll uh, one specialist licensed by our regulator, in so-called investment advisors, uh, with the license granted by the regulator uh, after they had passed uh, three stage exams with quite a low uh, pass rate. Mm. And Another uh, very unusual solution introduced in Poland uh, was a kind of a guarantee for the clients of the second pillar, a guarantee in terms of the investment results. So um, a gap was measured in the investment result between the investment result of a given pension fund and the average result of all pension funds. If, and if the gap was too high, then par part of the gap had to be covered by the pension fund asset manager from his own resources. Uh, so uh, quite a significant risk for an asset manager and it influenced the behavior, investment behavior of pension funds quite significantly. And it, it even happened twice uh, in the beginning of the system right after the dot-com bubble. Uh, one of the asset managers had to contribute to the fund from his own resources. I will get back to this solution later in more detail. Uh, another uh, solution is uh, a random choice, or random assignment of uh, people who did not choose uh, their own pension fund on their own to the pension funds, but to the pension funds with best investment results. But it was a random choice, also a kind of uh, thing that wanted pension funds to, to have uh, quite a good investment results. And so, well, pension funds were and still are highly regulated in Poland, so I'm not representative of a regulator, just a portfolio manager, so I will not uh, just provide you a list, a full list of details, but to give you a flavor of that. For example, uh, currently, and it, it used to be like that in the past, my entire investment team, starting from the juniors and just entry levels uh, employees, uh, has to file uh, statements of financial interest with the regula regulator on an annual basis. So we have to simply summarize our wealth every year and provide regulator with information about that wealth. And then our regulator, together with tax authorities, is checking whether we did not get too wealthy too fast, uh, which is, of course, a point uh, in such a, a solution like second pillar and uh, taking into account the special um, 
what's, how, what's, what, what kind of special solution and how important from social point of view we have here. And one very unfortunate thing about second pillar uh, in, in the very beginning of the system is that the future payouts from the uh, second pillar pension funds uh, had not been regulated. It was not said how the money will be transferred from the funds to the beneficiaries after the beneficiaries retire. In 1999, it was just said, we'll get back to it later, uh, and also uh, created some troubles in the future. Now, a list of things that were initially assumed and planned to be implemented, but finally were not implemented, and they created deficits that were not taken into account when the system was created. And now that it is currently, we can just ask the question whether it is the system that was wrong or uh, the implementation, but uh, nevertheless, uh, let us get back to this list. Uh, first, the very important point, it was assumed in 1999 that proceeds from the privatization will cover a majority of the deficit created by the second pillar implementation. And I found, before this presentation, I found a data summarizing first 13 years of the existence of the system. And according to the data, proceeds from the privatization were equal to two-thirds of the contributions to the second pillar. So two-thirds of the deficit could have been covered with privatization proceeds but the money was spent somewhere else, and of course it created some huge problem with the deficit in the end. Uh, there was also a plan to reduce the deficit by increasing the retirement and age for women, because in Poland it is 60, and for men it's 65, so just increasing that age would have uh, some impact, in, significant impact on the reduction of the, on the deficit and uh, reducing it. Uh, there were some exceptions in the following years, for example, uniform services, so soldiers, policemen, etc., were excluded from the system, um, uh, from the general pension system, minors uh, as well in 2005, uh, and the system of disability pensions was not adjusted in line with the, in line with the entire system, and it is also a significant source of uh, deficit in Polish public finance. Uh, and another thing worth mentioning, uh, it is what I call Eurostat issue. Mm. When the system was created in 1997, uh, it was unknown how Eurostat mm, will consider that second pillar. It was hoped that second pillar will be considered a part of public fi finance. And in this case, the treasuries held by second pillar pension fund would not be considered a public debt. So the figure for public debt to GDP ratio that is quite impor important in European Union, for example, due to Maastricht criteria, that we, which we have to comply with, would have been lower. But unfortunately, finally, after five years of uh, operations by the system, in 2004, uh, Eurostat finally claimed that under the, their methodology that they used at that time, second pillar is not a part of a public sector, and, well, it was a kind of uh, penalizing the countries which introduced second pillar relative to the countries without a second pillar. Uh, but nevertheless, one of the hopes of uh, the people introducing second pillar uh, was not fulfilled. And that was also uh, a bridge to the assumptions. It is just worth taking a note that currently Eurostat, maybe after what happened in Hungary, what happened in Hungary and in Poland, uh, changed its methodology related to pension uh, pension deficits calculation, and but not in a way to include second pillar into the public uh, finance, public sector, but rather to make all the countries feel this uh, the, um, similarly uncomfortable with their future pension deficits. So when talking about pensions, currently countries have to include uh, all the hidden debts, so fu all future liabilities related to the pension system and the transfer between second and first pillar would not be relevant uh, any longer. Uh, however, getting back to the headline figures, so headline figures of public debt to GDP, for example, that Eurostat is issuing for European Union countries, uh, the, the, those hid that hidden debt is not included there still. Uh, now, passing on to the 2014 uh, reform, mm, well, I used the expression gradual decline here, However, uh, the first move was not a gradual one, it was quite a significant one. I would say it's, it was quite a, quite a jump or quite a leap uh, because 51.5% of the assets was transferred from pension funds 
uh, to the first pillar or so our security, security system administ uh, social security system administration uh, and it was 9% of GDP and uh, the 9% of GDP is the reduction in public debt, debt that immediately took place in Poland uh, after that reform. And uh, to, have it in, 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 in to, uh, to have it in perspective, uh, we have to say that in 2013 or even 12, it was clear that in two, or at most three years, Poland will exceed 60% public debt to GDP ratio and break Maastricht criteria, therefore that 9% was something very significant. Mm at that point in time and gave uh, government uh, some uh, place or, or room to, 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 inc to not, not to cut budget deficits. Uh, so th that is uh, one thing. Another thing is that so when the transfer took place, uh, it was, well, there were some records uh, in the first pillar, so there were uh, there was there are separate accounts in the first pillar related to the former second pillar, and the money taken away from the second pillar is recorded on the accounts in the first pillar. And an um, interesting thing is that it is indexed or the valorization for those accounts is equal to the average nominal GDP growth for the last five years, which I mention here because sometimes, for example in Poland, media mm, consider this as an investment result of the first pillar or, or, the, or of the state-controlled asset manager and uh, try to compare it with the second pillar investment results. Even though it's quite controversial, but uh, some people understand it this way. Uh, and now getting uh, to the most important point here uh, mentioned before, uh, there was an automatic transfer of all new contributions uh, to the pension system uh, from the first pillar, uh, from the second pillar to the first pillar. So all the people were automatically moved with their future contributions to the first pillar, back from the second one, unless uh, they filed a statement with the uh, Social Security Administration that they want to stay in the second pillar. Uh, and in this case, close to 3% of the gross salary uh, is still contributed to the uh, second pillar. And let me just add to this uh, that during the period when the, the people had to make their decision, advertising of the second pillar was forbidden in Poland. So it was prohibited to advertise second pillar. So this might explain why uh, only 15.4% uh, of the people decided to stay in the system uh, at least partially. Mm. Uh, and uh, finally, also the uh, way the money is paid out from the second pillar uh, to the retirees uh, was regulated. Currently, uh, the process starts 10 years before reaching the re retirement age. Uh, it is a gradual process spread over 10 years. Uh, it is said that it is to mitigate the uh, bad date risk. So just to mitigate the risk that someone retires uh, during the downturn in the financial markets. So that's how it was mm, developed. And uh, currently, second pillar uh, pensions are, in fact, paid from the first pillar only. There is no second pillar payment. So there's a gradual process of getting back uh, from second to the first pillar before retirement. And uh, what uh, are the results of those solutions. So here we have uh, a forecast made in 2016 of the value of uh, assets under management uh, in the second pillar. Uh, well, it does not take into account quite a nice rate, uh, rate of return in 2017, because in 2017 it was close to 20% on average for pension fund uh, industry in Poland. So. Uh, the numbers on the left-hand side, uh, the nominal value should be a bit higher, but the general trends are as follows. Uh, and those are, uh, that is data that is public, uh, publicly available. Also in Aviva, where I work, we made some calculations with our actuaries, and I can confirm that uh, those are the trends that we should be observing in the coming years. So the red line is the scenario under which uh, an annual rate of return is 2.5%, so each year the rate of return, return equals 2.5%. And as you can see, the decline of the assets under management should start, let's say, in a dec decade. 
And if the rate of return is equal to 5% annually, so th this is a blue line, the decline should start uh, a couple of years later. But sooner or later, eventually, uh, the assets under management should start declining because there are very few people contributing to the system and people who are in the system are getting colder and their money is being taken away to the first pillar. Uh, now let me also uh, provide you with a chart on one of the controversial issues uh, related to the second pillar reform in Poland, um, namely fees. Uh, asset management fee, which is a blue line and it is uh, left-hand side, is close to half percent. It was also in the first presentation. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say it's controversial. I, I haven't heard any uh, discussions about it or so it is considered more or less close to fair value. Uh, the benchmark could be here, uh, for example, ETFs uh, and ETFs for emerging markets are illiquid markets and Polish market is not really liquid, are, are that half percent. Uh, the controversies were uh, about the upfront fee, let me call it this way. So the amount of money that was taken immediately after uh, from the contribution to the system monthly, on a monthly basis, after the money was paid out into the second pillar. And as you can see in the beginning, the average upfront fee was 9% uh, of the contribution paid into the system. Uh, what was, the what was the justification behind that number, if there can be any? Mm. Well, it was, first of, it was said that uh, well, the setup of the system is very expensive, as I mentioned. You had to set up a separate company, hire a group of people, hire them before the launch of the system, so it was creating costs. And there were hardly any assets in the fund, uh, so asset management fee was insignificant. Therefore, the expenses had to be covered from that, uh, from the cu current contributions, and therefore the, that fee was quite significant. Part of that fee is taken by the first pillar administration, just for the transfer to the second pillar, but it's less than one percent, uh, not close to close to that one percent. Mm. And my personal understanding is, uh, or impression, maybe not understanding, is that after the cut to uh, six percent, it was a kind of forgotten, that upfront fee. And the assets were growing larger. Uh, the legislator uh, seemed to have forgotten about it. And uh, pension fund managers, pension fund managing companies, uh, were quite unwilling to cut those rates by themselves because clients uh, were uh, insensitive uh, to the level of fees. One of the asset managers decided to cut upfront fees uh, and uh, there was no benefit in terms of the number of clients acquired due to that move. So uh, it discouraged other managers uh, from cutting the fees. And uh, all the major moves here in this chart uh, moves down in that upfront fee were caused by the regulator and by imposing uh, and lowering the cap on that upfront fee. And currently they are below 2% on average and half of it is taken by the first pillar, so it's, well, more or less, uh, hmm, uh, at least significant, but of not, uh, significantly le less important that in, than in the past. Uh, now getting to the second uh, pillar pension funds themselves in detail, uh, let me summarize shortly their investment policy in the first period, so until 2000, 2014. Uh, let me start with saying that in general pension funds were supposed to be quite simple investment vehicles. Long only equity, treasuries, some corporate bonds and more mortgage backed securities but very simple ones. Uh, just simple pass through securities. Mm. And uh, therefore there were some restrictions on investments into derivatives. Uh, Technically, it is possible for a pension fund to use derivatives to hedge uh, currency risk and only currency risk. But so far, no asset manager had been brave enough to try to discuss it with a regulator. So there was no use of even FX derivatives in Poland. And from my experience, I don't think regulator, regulator would be very happy about that. Uh, and in general, to, to, with the FX exposure, other than foreign securities. Uh, there, there is a ban on short selling, uh, you, we cannot leverage the fund, uh, so we, uh, and also um, there are restrictions on alternative investments. Uh, 
there were some alternative investments, for example, in the fund that I managed. We, we, we had uh, a real estate fund developing office buildings in Warsaw, uh, but it was very challenging and demanding, like uh, discussing it with a regulator. Fortunately, uh, it, it had a very good investment result in the end. Uh, so that I'm able to, to present here mm -hmm. and discuss it with you. Mm -hmm. There was also a ban on investments in the securities of the shareholder. So for example, if I work for a company where a uh, third Polish largest private bank has some 10% stake uh, and that bank is a member of a Banco Santander group, then we are prohibited from investing in any, in any securities of the entities from the Banco Santander group globally. That is to prevent uh, benefiting shareholders of the pension fund asset managers in any way, but it is not the case for mutual funds in Poland. So it is different in this case. 40% uh, equity cap, uh, it was also presented before, I guess, in, in the case of uh, the, plan, uh, the plant cap for your reform. And initially there was just 5% foreign investments exposure allowed. So a very small number, I will get back to it. Uh, later, so, it was, uh, so pension funds were supposed to invest locally, and all those limitations effectively made um, pension funds invest into Polish treasury bonds as uh, equity market was developed enough to invest up to 40% of uh, assets into, in this market. But corporate bonds markets and mortgage-backed securities markets are uh, rather underdeveloped relative to to other uh, uh, markets, therefore the only thing left uh, are treasuries. Uh, now, uh, being more specific about that uh, kind of guarantee for the clients, or here it is called compensation mechanism, uh, every six months, uh, regulator uh, was calculating three-year uh, weighted average rate of return, uh, weighted with the asset value, but there was a 15% cap uh, on a single weight. So even if a fund had more than 20% market share in terms of asset value during the uh, regulatory rate of return calculation, it was uh, reduced to 15%. Uh, and in good times, when, rate of re when rates of return were high, uh, the acceptable gap in the investment result was half of that average rate of uh, return. But if the investment result was lower than 50% uh, of that average, then the difference between the actual investment result and that half of that weighted average uh, would have uh, uh, to be covered by the asset manager. Uh, the situation uh, got worse when uh, in bad times, uh, in, in downturns, downturns in the markets, because then the acceptable gap was just 4% over three years. Uh, uh, so if, if the rate of return was 8% or lower, uh, your investment result uh, could not have been uh, lower uh, by more than 4% than the average. And 4% over three years for the funds that have roughly one third of their assets in quite volatile equity markets was not a lot. And it made some of the asset managers, supervisor boards of the and managing companies quite nervous, what I also experienced. Uh, sometimes we simply had to control for the risk and uh, there was no, no option not to, not, not to pay attention to that. There was also a kind of reward that I already mentioned uh, related to that average return. Uh, so the funds, uh, uh, the, the, the clients that did not choose uh, a pension fund on their own were randomly distributed among the funds that had investment results above the average. Funds with the results below the average were not included in that uh, random assignment of clients. And for some smaller funds with uh, no distribution network, uh, low advertising, co-marketing uh, budgets, it was the main uh, source of the acquisition of clients. So purely having a good investment results uh, and uh, acquiring clients through that uh, random draw uh, w was the main source of growing the fund and client uh, base. Uh, one more incentive that is, I think, worth mentioning, uh, bec uh, incentive to generate good investment results is so-called bonus account. It is still in place uh, nowadays. Uh, it works like that. Bonus account is uh, an account created within a pension fund uh, so it's a part of uh, net asset value of, of, the, of the pension fund. Uh, 
every month 0.005%, so half a bips, half a basis point, is transferred from the pension fund assets to that bonus account. So it's just six basis points annually, but please compare it with around 50 bips of asset management fee, and then it becomes significant. And every six months, based on the average free year, year investment result relative to competitors, a pension fund asset manager can take part of the bonus account for, uh, for him. Uh, self. Uh, so th that's a reward for good investment results. A fund with the best investment result, a manager of that fund takes 100% of bonus account. The fund with the worst investment results uh, can get no money out of that bonus account. And the rest is split uh, on a linear basis compared to the worst and uh, the, the best investment uh, result. Uh, another mm, very important and interesting thing is taking a look at the uh, investment restrictions uh, uh, since 2014. So after, the, after that major change in the system took place after takeover of treasuries. Mm. So there was, of course, ban on investment into treasury bonds introduced, uh, uh, which was quite obvious after, after all the treasuries were, ta were, ta were taken away. Uh, but uh, the very interesting thing, uh, rather unusual for the investment uh, management industry, was a floor, not a cap, but a floor on investments into equity. Uh, it was a gradual floor, gra gradually declining floor. There was a fear that after uh, the reform, uh, asset managers will try to adjust their portfolio to reduce the level of risk. Uh, because after the treasuries were taken, uh, pension funds ended up with something like 85% 80, of equity allocation. So those were quite aggressive funds and the sell-off was one of the options. Therefore, those floors were introduced. Uh, it was 75% for 2014 and 15% uh, 2017 and currently there is no floor any longer, but there are hardly any alternatives to equity markets. Mm. A cap on foreign investments was increased to 30%, but it was uh, not the willingness of our legislator to increase it, uh, but simply a European Court of Justice ruled that 5% cap on foreign investments is against uh, the free flow of capital rule that should be respected uh, in the Europe European Union. And that's the only reason, according to my knowledge, uh, behind that increase from 5 to 30% cap on foreign investments. Uh, the compensation mechanism or the guarantee for the clients uh, has been removed in 2014, uh, so that risk is no longer in place. It would be very difficult to manage a fund, 85% equity, uh, with just 4% uh, potential gap or uh, 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 to the average result of the entire industry and over three, four percent over three years. Uh, there is now official benchmark, but to be honest, there are no consequences and uh, I, I'm not sure if it impacts uh, pension funds in any matter, in any manner. Uh, the official benchmark is 80% equity and 20% money market. Local equity, Warsaw Stock Exchange equi uh, equity and 20% uh, is just money market Polish, Polish lot rate in this case. Uh, now taking a look at the importance of the second pillar uh, in Poland at some uh, points in time. Uh, unfortunately, the earliest available data is the beginning of 2008 currently, publicly available, provided by our regulator. But it's, I think it's a good moment in time because uh, it is close to the top of the bull market uh, before Lehman. Uh, so I took this data mm, for the first reference point, then next reference point is the end of 2013, so right before that 2014 reform, uh, and the end of the last year. So as you can see, portfolio as percent of GDP uh, was uh, at the peak uh, close to 20%. Uh, it's very difficult to, to say if those numbers are important, but for example, relative to the first presentation and what you project for Ukraine, those numbers are, are lower. Uh, so that is one of the perspectives that we can take. Uh, uh, one number that I was able to find uh, uh, related to the estimates uh, of the impact on the economy, 
as are the estimates done by our former Minister, Minister of Finance, Mr. Gronitsky, uh, just below the table, and uh, former advisor to our Prime Minister Tusk, uh, uh, Mr. Jankowiak. And according to their model, uh, Polish GDP in 2012 uh, would have been 7% lower without second pillar. But, uh, well, I would be very careful about that estimate. Uh, models are about assumptions. But the general logic behind it is that if you take the money and put it into the first pillar, it is just consumed. If you take the money into the second pillar, even at the cost of debt, increasing debt, then it is partly put into the companies that invest in something. So that, that's just the very basic and very simple logic behind uh, such calculations. Um, and I think that, that it is not that controversial. The number itself can be. Uh, from the perspective of Warsaw Stock Exchange, uh, we can, without any doubt, say that uh, the second pillar was and still is of crucial importance. Uh, the share in the market cap of Polish companies listed at Warsaw Stock Exchange to exclude large international companies that are for some reason listed in Poland, like uh, mentioned Banco Santander or Italian Unicredit, but there is no liquidity in their shares. So taking into account P uh, Polish companies, it was 10% in 2008, but uh, it is now more, uh, more than 20%. And uh, just to... Also, to put it in the right perspective, market cap is not telling the whole story. Uh, the free float at Warsaw Stock Exchange is close to 60% of the market cap. So if we, t take, if we try to calculate the share in the free float of the companies at Warsaw Stock Exchange of the second pillar, uh, then it is uh, close to 40% even. So it's below, let's say, between 35 and 40% of free float at Warsaw Stock Exchange is held by second pillar pension funds. When it comes to trading activity, it is definitely, the share is definitely much lower. Pension funds are not as active investors as mutual funds or foreign investors. It's rather buying, holding, uh, of course, adjusting, but the trading activity is significant, significantly lower. But unfortunately, I was unable to find any publicly available data related to this. And to end the story, uh, I would like to say that from my impression, let's, let's just put it this way, my impression based on my experience but also on the data published from, from time to time about the portfolio structure of pension funds in Poland is that oh, during recent years and still even after that reform of 2014, pension funds uh, uh, take significant uh, part in the IPOs at Warsaw Stock Exchange. And by significant, uh, I would say 40 to 50 percent, uh, but from excluding the, the, the smallest offers. But that is just my impression. It's not an official number, but I think it, it should be close to the truth. So 40 to 50 percent of, let's say, 50 to 100, uh, let's say 100 million US dollars and larger offers is usually taken by second pillar pension funds, and there is still some potential, some cash uh, for, to, to spend on at least good IPOs. Uh, the portfolio structure that we can observe in the in table uh, uh, below, uh, well, it was close to 40 uh, and even 40 percent before the 2014 reform. Uh, it is now 80 percent, and exposure to foreign equities is just 6 percent. I wouldn't say that Polish pension funds are unwilling to invest into foreign equities, but since 2014 we had a bull market uh, well, all around, I would say, at least in the, in the developed markets. And also taking a look at the valuations of Polish companies relative to their foreign peers, the valuations in Poland are lower, maybe also due to that reform. And it is simply very difficult to make a decision to move the money away from companies worth like 10 to 15 times earnings into companies worth more than 20 times earnings which is the case for many developed markets. So the, but the, there was a gradual process of increasing that foreign equity exposure. As you can see, some funds exceed 10% of exposure in, in foreign equity. But in general, there was not, it was not a significant move, and it is far, uh, still far from that 30% cap. Uh, but maybe in our market conditions, something will change. Oh, and those 14% of other are mainly deposits as there is hardly an alternative currently to deposits, because corporate bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities are simply... Well, let's say that pension funds tend to be, tend to be very conservative when it comes to corporate bonds. Mm. 
simply there were some there I would say that uh, there were some also well, scandals about it in Poland and uh, with conservative profile uh, with very few blue chip uh, issuers in, in the corporate bonds markets we, we tend to refrain from this uh, markets there's simply it is difficult for us to find anything interesting and with acceptable level of risk uh, now there's one more thing that should be added talking about the role of the pension funds uh, for Warsaw Stock Exchange it is the corporate governance in, uh, in the listed companies here are some examples of the shareholder structures of the three of uh, the, the companies listed uh, in Warsaw so for example on the left we've got company named Electro Budova uh, and you can see that nine pension funds hold 75% um, uh, of the uh, company's capital Another example uh, on the top right uh, is a company called Kente, uh, and there are five pension funds hold more than 50% of the capital in the company. Uh, and at the bottom, we've got another example with four funds holding, uh, because the first four are pension funds, uh, are holding uh, close to 60% of the capital of the company. Therefore, pension funds uh, are... Mm, taking part in the shareholder meetings uh, and are very active players there mm, and the decisions that uh, are made the most important decisions uh, in which pension funds are included are of course the composition of the supervisor board uh, uh, then uh, dividend payouts uh, management option schemes uh, also some changes to the articles of association of the companies uh, and uh, we well the biggest managers uh, the, the managers of the biggest pension funds had to develop uh, uh, corporate governance standards we publish those standards on our websites and uh, we are very strict about following those standards and also our regulator is very active in uh, looking to it that we do not cooperate during shareholder meetings that we act independently any form of the cooperation would be heavily penalized so uh, it is not to, to take over the companies it is just to provide a prudent co corporate governance in those companies uh, and i think that from the perspective of the regulator it is also quite convenient it's, uh, it is quite comfortable to supervise private uh, co companies uh, not for example it, 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 I, I believe so that for, for example, super supervising our state administration in state-owned companies listed at Warsaw Stock Exchange might be uh, might might prove to be difficult. Uh, now, some key obstacles, uh, and honestly speaking, the, there is just one obstacle uh, from my perspective. It is the deficit in the first pillar, or in general, we can argue that uh, a deficit in the public sector. Uh, of and some, of course, exception to the system uh, that creates those deficits. Uh, I was trying to find some technical obstacles that were encountered in 1999. I had some discussions with the people responsible for the implementation of uh, the second pillar, but not from the regulatory perspective, but from the pension fund manager perspective. And uh, honestly speaking, well, there, there were, the biggest challenge was data processing, because suddenly thousands and millions of people were enrolled into the new system, uh, and the processing had to take place on a daily basis. Like the contribution unit valuation, net asset valuation had to take place every, every day, and there were transfer, transfer in and out from the system mm, uh, taking place quite frequ frequently, maybe not on a daily basis, but very frequently. And th th this imposed some mm, uh, challenges, imposed some challenges. Uh, but that's, that's it, as, mm, f at least from the mm, asset manager perspective. Uh, and please, but please note that uh, Polish uh, solution was a very simple solution. So one company, one fund only, so n n nothing complicated there. Uh, also, the solutions used were the solutions that had been previously developed for the mutual funds industry, so like a custodian, like a net asset valuation, all the back office processes, uh, all the things were taken from the mutual funds industry and implemented in the second pillar. Uh, the third bullet point here is actually quite important, uh, that lack of education. It is a very general statement, uh, but let's just say that in 2014, it turned out that uh, majority of participants, there's no official data, 
but the, the general feeling is that it was majority of participants uh, did not know to which pension fund they are assigned, even though they received a, an annual letter from a pension fund asset manager. But still, that social awareness of uh, how the second, uh, the second pillar works was quite low. Uh, so that is one thing. Uh, also, um, for example, uh, what I mentioned uh, already, uh, clients uh, were, not, were not sensitive to the level of fees. Which, is, which I would, I would also, which I would also attribute to the lack of education, and there was no incentive for for asset managers to compete using using fees or cutting the fees down. Uh, so th th those are the examples of that lack of the education and the consequences of it, uh, and of course high sensitivity to political decisions. Mm is an obvious thing uh, in this case, at least in Polish case. Uh, one thing specific about Poland, uh, which is just, uh, I, I think it might be interesting to mention, after 2014 reform, our constitutional court uh, ruled that uh, financial means governed in the second pillar uh, were and are not a typical private property. It is something between public and private, and therefore, uh, the legislator had the right to move it from the second to the first pillar and, for example, to remit treasuries. And after that, in Poland, we are now forced to think of third pillar solutions because the trust in the second pillar is significantly undermined, and that is what we are doing here. Of course, the other option is to change the constitution, but the uh, cur current, uh, current government does not have enough votes in the parliament to change the constitution, therefore they are trying to work out a third pillar solution. But it would be nice to, uh, yes, to, to, to have a clear statement of, of, of that uh, before the implementation of the second pillar. Now the controversial issues. Uh, so the things that were uh, found uh, quite, uh, uh, let's say, unclear and discussable. So fees, fees were quite high, that upfront fee, I already showed it. That guarantee for the participants, it was, uh, it was something... Uh, very unusual relative to our systems. Well, the idea behind it is that, uh, uh, well, it was supposed to mitigate the risk of the unlucky choice of the pension fund asset manager, simply. So uh, my pension, my retirement income should not differ significantly from the retirement income of the other participants, uh, simply or solely due to the bad choice of the asset manager or bad investment results, because it might prove to be, not to be socially acceptable. Uh, that was the reason behind it, but still the, it was quite controversial uh, and also uh, it's imposed some costs on the system. Asset managers had to take that risk into account. Uh, and also the third bullet point, there was and still is just one fund for all the participants. So uh, in the system is uh, developed uh, in the manner that a 25-year-old has the same equity allocation as the 55-year-old person. And I think it is quite obvious that we've got different risk tolerance levels uh, in those two cases. Mm, so, but uh, th there were some discussions about the introduction of the multi-fund uh, solution, but eventually they were not uh, implemented. Uh, those investment limitations were also a kind of uh, controversy. Mm like foreign securities, but also private equity and real estate funds. Uh, well, it, it was not forbidden, but it was very difficult to invest into such solutions. And the thing already also mentioned the lack of the mm, solution for the mm, financial means distribution at the end of the uh, saving period and when, when a person retires. Now there is a new third pillar plan. Uh, it is very specific, as you can see. There are there are some num num there are, I, I always able to provide uh, some numbers, and there, as, as I said, there is a complete draft of the legislation. Uh, it, is, it is called a third pillar solution. Uh, those it is well, it's, it may be translated as employees' capital pension schemes. Uh, and uh, it is said that all private companies will have to sign an agreement with an asset manager and set up such a scheme for uh, its employees. It is going to be obligatory that set up. Uh, then employees will be automatically en enrolled into the system. And this means voluntary, but they can withdraw, opt out from the system if they want. But they will have to submit 
a statement that they uh, withdraw from the system. And even if they withdraw, every two years, they will be enrolled again. <laughs> and therefore, as I said, I call it quasi third pillar system. And, uh, when it comes to the contributions to the system, 2% uh, of uh, remuneration, gross remuneration of the uh, employee is going to be paid into that third pillar uh, solution. It is employee's money. It's just, it is the money that he's getting now, so he will have to accept the slight decrease of his remuneration. Then 1.5% of remuneration is going to be covered by the employer. Uh, and both those numbers can be increased twice. So from two to four, it is possible to go from two to four percent if a person is willing to. And then the, uh, the state will, or just uh, state budget will uh, also contribute paying some like, how, how it's, let's say it's seventy-five dollars US dollars uh, annually. Uh, and the system is to be based on life cycle funds. Uh, managed by mutual fund companies, so it's not restricted to the second pillar specific companies. Uh, any asset manager with three years of experience uh, and no controversies around him should be able to provide uh, that investment uh, solution. Mm. And uh, the difference between uh, those life cycle funds is uh, going to be mainly equity allocation to my understanding, because some examples were shown, so there's this higher equity allocation for younger people and decreasing with age. Uh, a cap on fees, uh, a cap on fees is introduced after experience with the second pillar. Uh, the cap is 0.6% uh, management fee, but all, let's, let's just say all in uh, annually. So all expenses should be not greater than 0.6%. You cannot pay distributors for the acquisition of clients. It was the case with the second pillar. And the most successful uh, companies were, with the high, highest uh, asset base in the beginning of, uh, of the second pillar system in Poland were the ones who had uh, the most efficient distribution network. So simply were able to pay their uh, sales representatives for acquiring clients. So simply pay in cash. Uh, and it was later covered from that upfront fee mainly. Uh, and uh, if the company does not sign an agreement with a chosen asset manager, a uh, private asset manager, then the state-controlled entity will uh, become the asset manager for that scheme for that uh, company. So this is shortly how it, is, how it may look like in Poland beginning next year, because still there is a plan to implement it next year, although there are now concerns that there might be a delay, de delay in the implementation of the system. And as I said, it is still, the legislation is still not adopted, so there will always be an uncertainty, because even in, in our ruling party, there are different opinions about that solution. Uh, just a short slide, I won't go through uh, the details, but we've got some third pillar solutions currently. So as you can see, those are tax-exempt accounts. So there is uh, one solution that is personal income tax exempt. So if you pay the money there, you can deduct it from your uh, income tax base. Uh, and it is close to, let's say, one and a half thousand US dollars, uh, which is a bit above uh, average re remuneration in, po in Polish economy currently. And there is also, uh, it, it is capital gains uh, tax exempt. And another solution is capital gains tax exempt, but it is subject to personal income tax uh, uh, the limit is higher in this case, and finally, there is no tax at, uh, at, the, at the end. In the first instance, there is a 10% tax because there was no, ta no income tax initially. So there are, there are some solutions with tax exemptions, with some uh, pay-in limits. Uh, there are also some employee capital pension, let's say, programs, but solutions very similar to this one, but those were, let's say, purely voluntary, set up by some of the largest companies in Poland. And there are still social, some, some, some exemptions from social security dues uh, to encourage employers to do that. Uh, uh, but well, rather, rather few companies uh, have those uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, finally, the proposal for the second pillar um, related to that third pillar introduction is uh, 
there is a proposal, but it's not going to be introduced next year, maybe 2020, uh, we will see. Uh, so the second pillar is still there. Uh, and uh, currently the base case is for our gov current government is uh, that uh, a second pillar might be gradually transformed into a third pillar. Uh, during one of the meetings with the advisor to our prime minister responsible for the reform, uh, I heard the period of seven years. So a seven year period of gradual liberalization of the investment restrictions. Uh, and after seven years, a person would be free to do whatever uh, he or she wants with the money governed in that currently second and finally third pillar account. But that's just the plan. We'll see if it, if it is adopted. Uh, recently, it was stated that the government would like to see uh, how that third, new third pillar proposition works. Uh, my, my general impression about the, um, what, what um, Polish le legislator uh, uh, is afraid of in case of recent uh, pension f pension reforms uh, is uh, just uh, the well-being of stock exchange. To just to put it short, I mean, Polish politicians don't want to break stock exchange in Poland, to, to shortly speaking. Uh, we've got quite a uh, well-developed stock exchange. Of course, it's far from being perfect, but it is sizable. Sizable. There are many private companies, uh, privately developed, just from scratch. Not only former state-owned companies. So it is uh, quite an important part of our economy. And I think that simple politicians want to see what are the inflows into that new third pillar, and then they will see if they can start adjusting second pillar, risking outflows from the second pillar, and uh, just a sell off of equity part of the second pillar. That, just my, that, that is just my personal impression. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm not involved in those uh, d d discussions. Okay, now we've, I hope we've got some time for a discussion. Uh, we've got from the 60 minutes, five minutes left, but we can, I guess, make it longer. <laughs> Colleagues, if you have any questions, uh, okay, yes, sure. But if you have a question in Ukraine, please give a time for a speaker to get the headset. Oh, yes, that might be. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, really necessary in Ukraine at the moment because we are in the beginning of like the, the, the I would say we are in the middle of the discussion about the second pillar here. And uh, Poland experience is uh, being presented as like a very successful, and then we see that in Poland everything is uh, reverted back. So um, I have two questions, probably um, from more macroeconomic point of view. The first is on the estimation of 7% GDP growth in Poland. Um, and uh, the second, probably it's connected, about the um, prerequisite for the second pillar introduction um, or being the first pillar without deficit. So. Uh, in Ukraine, the idea behind the new law on uh, pension system is that it is a new tax imposed on people which has to go to uh, the second pillar. Uh, and uh, this money go out of the current consumption. So, for example, if uh, you take the money out of current consumption and you put it into the uh, government bonds, and government state-owned banks and so on, uh, because in Ukraine there is no equity. Uh, so would you have the same effect on GDP as you had in Poland? Or in Poland it was like the uh, social contribution split and that is why you had the uh, GDP growth. S and uh, that is actually the, the behind this uh, prerequisite for the, sec for the first pillar. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my understanding is the, that uh, the money was not taken from the current consumption, but it simply increased public debt. It was financed with the treasuries. And in the beginning of the system, even parts, uh, part, part of the contribution to the second pillar was uh, made in the form not of cash, but in treasury bonds directly. So it was increasing debt, and we've, then we've, we have multiple effect because the money is put again into the economy, w working into the companies mainly. So that is my un un understanding. But if just as I said, it's very difficult to distinguish between the impact of the, uh, let's say, consumption and investments in the economy in the long run. But in general, we, we tend to believe, I think, that investments are required and that create the base for the higher GDP or product in, in the coming years. But that's what I can say in the answer to this question. Just 
Um, Mr. Shavluk, my question is, uh, did Poland have uh, any reforms of um, maybe stock market, maybe corporate government uh, uh, governance uh, linked to the introduction of the second pillar in 1999? Uh, actually, no. no. Nothing crosses my mind. Now, the, the, the Warsaw Stock Exchange was launched in uh, uh, April 1991. So it was after, after eight years of uh, the development of Warsaw Stock Exchange. We had that certification for investment advisors, as I mentioned, and stockbrokers, but nothing was changed there at that point in time. Just uh, those new companies uh, had to be, uh, were implemented, the new type of a company, asset manager, when it comes to corporate governance. Uh, I wouldn't say there is a regulation of corporate governance in Poland. There is a code, a code of contact, uh, co conduct for companies listed at Warsaw Stock Exchange. And Warsaw Stock Exchange is adjusting this code of conduct. But I wouldn't say there is uh, any specific uh, central re regulation adopted by the legislator or the parliament. So nothing, nothing of that sort crosses my mind. One question this time. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, the, the question is uh, on, on the transfer from uh, a defined benefit to defined contribution uh, uh, plan type uh, for second pillars that you had in 1999. So, to my understanding, pure defined benefit plans where all assets are owned by the fund and the fund had uh, uh, liabilities to plan participants and on defined, pure defined contribution fund, uh, each participant had uh, his or her own account and the uh, liabilities equal to the balance on that account. So, uh, do you know how it was technically done, this transition from defined benefit to defined contribution type and... Uh, but do you mean the first pillar or the second? Second one? pillar. Second. I mean. Well, second was introduced, and the, the balance sheet structure is that there, is, there are assets, so mainly investment portfolio. And uh, on the, uh, on the uh, passive side, there are just liab liabilities to the clients, and that's it. Uh, so that's the source of uh, finance, uh, financing of the, of the assets. So the, 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 there, there are no benefits defined in the second pillar. It is, it is the, the benefit is unknown so at, 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 at a given point in time. Yeah, but initially they were known, right? Before 1999? No, 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 no. It was just pay-as-you-go first pillar system, nothing of that sort. Thank you for the very interesting, enlightening presentation. One question uh, regarding the history. Uh, when the money was mandatorily transferred, I mean, when the pension, mm -hmm. uh, accumulated pensions were mandatorily transferred from uh, the uh, mm -hmm. second pillar to the first, I understand the intention behind that was for the government to, to, to improve the Maastricht ratio to, to ensure compliance with that. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, apparently, the, normally the first pillar is a solidar system, is depersonalized, so it's pay-as-you-go. But was the money taken by the government from the second pillar and put back into the first pillar, pillar was it still personalized or was it depersonalized at transfer? Ah, okay, very good question. Thank you for that. Uh, as you can see in the second bullet point here, there are some accounts that were set up at that point in time. Well, actually, they were set up in 2011 during the cutting the contributions to record money taken from the second pillar. But in general, currently, uh, people in Poland have let's say two accounts with the first pillar. One is the standard first pillar account, and the second account is to record the money taken from the uh, second pillar at that point in time, and the valorization for that second account is different. So it is recorded. There is no money behind it currently, but it is recorded. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more question, guys, because we need to... Thank you very much for your presentation. My question is... I think very useful. What you will suggest for Ukrainians to do or not to do in implementing the second, le uh, second level of pension system? Wow, uh, that's a very difficult question. Yes, and, I understand. Uh, <laughs> I can feel... It's very uh, difficult for us as well. Uh, yes. I, uh, <laughs> I'd say the level of responsibility that I uh, would have to assume is quite significant in this case. No, but... Uh, hmm. Just honestly speaking, I Maybe in, choos in choosing the second level model, mm -hmm. 
model Second of patience. Level model. No, I don't know Ukrainian like economy reality. It's too difficult for me. Just our experience is that uh, people. It is really. It, it, it would have been better to develop the system where people would have really felt that this is their money, that they knew the pension fund that they are assigned to, knew the risks, knew the pension fund investment policies, all all, all the things of that of that kind. It was I think it was the main main mistake in our case, and also the mistake on the side of the asset managers in educating their their clients. So that is just one major main remark that I would like to make here. Thank you.